Good afternoon, and a warm welcome to our conference in Colombia, Increasing Violence, Political Changes, and External Influence webinar. My name is Irene Mia. I'm Senior Fellow for Latin American Conflict Security and Development here at the AAAS. I'm also the editor of the Armed Conflict Service Series, which is one of the annual flagship publications of the AAAS, which provides uh, an exhaustive strategic review of uh, active armed conf conflict across the world uh, and their outlook. Uh, today's session focused on the conflict in Colombia is the fifth uh, in a series of um, IAAS conflict briefing, which is a bimonthly bi series. Uh, is also the first briefing we are focusing on a, on a Latin American country. Uh, previously, we have covered conflict in Mozambique, Syria, the Central African Republic, and Lake Chad. Uh, and you can find the recording actually on our website if you're interested. The conflict briefing series builds on our armed conflict survey ser um, series, as I said, and provides our practitioner and expert audience with clear, structured, and comprehensive information about active conflict across the world, leveraged the insight of eminent experts. Uh, we are fortunate enough to uh, involve in this, in the, in this event, like, like today. The conflict in Colombia is one of the longest and most intractable in the region, having morphed many times and, uh, and, and gaining complexity across the years. The 2016 uh, peace agreement between the, the Colombian government and the FARC, uh, the guerrilla um, Fuerza Armada Revolucionaria de Colombia, ended the five, uh, five decades long civil war, but failed to pacify the country completely, uh, heralding yet another phase of the conflict, fueled this time by drug trafficking and confrontation among complex constellation of actors, including left-wing guerrilla uh, ELN, which is not part of the peace accord, but also FARC dissident groups and former paramilitary right-wing groups, which have now turned into proper drug cartels. Instability in Venezuela, uh, with, whom, uh, with which Colombia shares a, a porous border, further complicates the, the conflict outlook. In the last couple of years, uh, escalating violence, uh, including massacres and murder of social and environmental leaders or activists, has resulted in uh, increasing force displacement in Colombia. Uh, moreover, the organization of uh, the, the reorganization, reorganization of drug trafficking uh, operation and amid the changing landscape of criminal actors and environmental degradation have added new stumbling block in the way of uh, a real uh, peace uh, for the country. The marked deterioration in socioeconomic condition brought about by the COVID pandemic has also added another layer of complexity to the situation in Colombia with increasingly inc increasingly um, uh, discontent, uh, civil society, social unrest, political polarization, and diminished trust in institutions. Last weekend, the country um, uh, had coalition primary side of presidential election in May, as well as uh, uh, legislative elections. But both uh, polls suggested a likely shift to the left uh, for the next administration, and the possibility of a next guerrilla member to become president of Colombia, which is a, a pretty significant uh, um, uh, change or development in, uh, in, uh, in, in Colombia. Uh, this would her herald uh, likely important change in security and drug policy. It could have important geopolitical ramification given uh, uh, Colombia's geographical position, as we said, next to Venezuela. It's being the world's biggest cocaine producer and also its traditional links with the US. To discuss these issues and much more, um, and as well as the outlook for the conflict, we are joined today by a fantastic panel of, uh, of speakers, uh, which I will introduce uh, in order of appearance. So we start with Dr. Andre Gomez Suarez, who is Senior Research Fellow in the Center for Religion, Reconciliation and Peace at the University of Winchester. He's a Colombian writer, international relations uh, scholar, and a peace practitioner. He currently lives in Oxford. He specializes in conflict resolution, peace negotiation, transitional justice, reconciliation, and dialogue. Uh, he's also the co-founder of the peace, peace building organization Rodemos El Dialogo Red. He's senior consultant in uh, positive negative and also an honorary research associate at the University of Bristol and the UCL Institute of the Americas. We're also joined by Kyle Johnson. Uh, Kyle is the co-founder and researcher at the Conflict Response Foundation in Bogota. 
He has worked for various NGO, Human Rights Watch, the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, uh, and also the International Crisis Group, uh, for, for which he was senior analyst for Colombia. We're also fortunate enough to have Kyle as one of our contributors for the upcoming Armed Conflict Service 2000, 2022. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. Jennifer Vargas Reina. She is a development and legacy consultant at SOAS University of London. She was a senior research officer in the Transnational, Transnational uh, Justice Network uh, in the School of Law and Human Rights Center at Essex University. Uh, recently, Jennifer finished her post postdoctoral research in agrarian studies program in Yale University, and her research focuses on the role of state of the of the state uh, in land grabbing in civil war and transitional uh, context. Uh, finally, we are joined by Dr. Annie de la Quintana. Uh, Annie is Associate Director at Control Risk, um, covering the Indian countries and Panama for the, for the firm Global Risk Anal Analysis Team, uh, based in Bogota as well. Um, Annie provides expert analysis of political, operational, social and security risk for client um, through consultancy, scenario planning, monitoring and assessment. She has worked with many different uh, types of clients in diverse, uh, in diverse industries. Um, Annie also worked uh, in political campaigning as a political strategist and analyst, uh, working both as a pollster and running her own political advisory business in Washington, DC. We're also joined by my colleague, uh, Juan Pablo Medina Bickel, uh, who is a research analyst with us at um, uh, CSDP and, Lat and also at the Latin American program with myself. Uh, he has worked on several research projects on socioeconomic development in conflict ridden environment and private sector engagement in peace building in Colombia. So before we start, just uh, uh, some quick logistic and housekeeping rules. Uh, um, we will start with a brief presentation by Juan on uh, current conflict trends. After that, we will have a round of introductory remarks by all the speakers, followed by a discussion, which we would like to be as interactive as, uh, and as inclusive as possible. Uh, to that end, uh, uh, if you could please add your question comment on the um, in the Q and A box uh, uh, at the at the bottom of your of your Zoom uh, um, uh, um, of your Zoom, I would say. Um, then we will pick it up. We will pick the question up in the course of our conversation. And if there is no time uh, during the during the the. the Conversation. We will we will uh, uh, try to address them at the end in the in the Q and A uh, section. Uh, we then uh, let's get started since we have lots to discuss. And uh, Juan, the floor is yours if you want to just uh, present the main trends of the conflict it is now. Thanks. Thank you, Rene. <clears throat> So in, in this short presentation, I'm going to briefly touch upon some data on conflict related fatalities and events in a way to open the presentation for our panelists. So I will do it by using the ACLE data for battles, explosions, remote violence and violence against civilians. So according to the criteria above, Colombia ended last year with an increase of over 40% in conflict-related deaths and over 70% in events compared to 2020. Nonetheless, the ratio of fatalities per event decreased by about 17% as the number of events increased at a higher rate than number of fatalities. So as this first map shows, from a geographical standpoint, there are different hotspots of conflict across the country, which we will probably delve into in the following presentations. But let me mention some of them, uh, like the Northwestern Territory, the South Pacific Coast, and the Northern part of the borderline with Venezuela. <clears throat> the latter in particular, in Norte de Santander, which records the highest number of fatalities today, accounting for around 50% of total fatalities in the country. Next is, uh, slide, please. <clears throat> so against this backdrop, the number of fatalities along the Colombian-Venezuela border is taking a 20 kilometer uh, buffer approximately on each side of the border, uh, significantly increased last year. As the graph shows, there were around 100 49 deaths, up from 63 in 2020. <clears throat> Next slide, please. 
as the as this uh, second map shows, most of the border fatalities are clustered along the northeast part of the border, mostly in the department of Norte Santander, as I mentioned. Nonetheless, there are other fatalities, though at a lower intensity, uh, located in the northern part of the border and in the eastern plains across Colombia and Venezuela, that more to the south. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Finally, um, I would like to end by showing some trends in the Colombian Amazon region. This is an area located in the southern part of the country, bordering with Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, and Venezuela. And this is a territory that claims today significant attention of diverse climate-related security issues. So as the graph shows, despite accounting for less than 10% of total fatalities nationwide by the event type of violence against civilians, there has been an overall increase in deaths over the past years in the departments with available data in the region. This is important as goes in line with the killings of social leaders and environmental defenders across the country and its nexus with climate insecurity threats. <clears throat> so yeah, this was my, my short presentation and I look forward to hearing from our speakers. I hand it over to Andre now. Thanks, Juan, and thanks for thanks, Hagrid, as well, for this fantastic uh, data. Um, um, if we can start with you, Andre, as, as also Juan mentioned, I know it's, a, it's quite a challenging question to ask, but could you provide as a very short overview uh, of the Colombia armed conflict so far? What are the key uh, historical drivers and, and actors? And also, if you can focus a little bit on the 2016 uh, peace process accord and, and um, the current state of it. Thank you, Irene, and thank you so much from Pablo and all at IISS for this kind invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. As you rightly said, this is a tremendous challenge, but sort of let me try to do the best I can in the next few minutes. I would summarize by saying that I'm going to talk about five old drivers, three drivers that are quite newer and one that is the newest. Uh, and then I move on to talk a bit about um, the peace agreement, uh, as you have asked me. So in the first part, let me tell you that the historical drivers uh, for this particular armed conflict could be uh, sort of drew back from 19, the 1940s. Um, and those five uh, that have been evolving since then are the following. Uh, the first one is political violence. Um, this really was such a central element and started with the killing of Gaetani in 1948. This unfolded in the civil war of La Violencia between 1948 and 1958. The solution to that civil war in Colombia that left more than 200,000 people killed was a power sharing agreement between liberal and conservatives, but that also opened um, the, a new phase of violence in Colombia, the killing of former combatants like Guadalupe Salcedo in 1956 and Priya Salap in 1960, and the stigmatization of former guerrilla leaders as criminals, and uh, communists uh, started the new phase of the conflict in the 1960s. Um, and um, we, this was with the creation of the Marxist-Leninist FARC in 1964 and other insurgency groups like the ELN in 1965, the EPL or Popular Liberation Army in 1967. And with that, we started like a new guerrilla warfare to struggle for land distribution. And that's perhaps the second trend, a really important driver of the conflict uh, in Colombia. There, there were attempts before to do a, an agrarian reform, but those attempts did not prosper. And in the 1960s, the, the armed struggle started to try to protect some of the regions uh, of, of some of the presence of different actors and campesinos tried to get hold of these regions by uh, resorting to violence. And that was a bit the nature of the FARC, so a, a, a struggle for land distribution. Um, they started going into the Amazon jungle and the frontiers of the country, and they started what some people have called armed colonization. So to try to open the agrarian frontier and destroy parts of the Amazonian jungle. 
But in the 1970s, there was another driver that this would be the third driver of the conflict, and is that in, in, in there was a, a process of urbanization and modernization in the country. Many people moved from the countryside to the cities, and that created a, a very serious level of inequality in the region, uh, inequality in the cities. And then a, a guerrilla group, the M19, uh, decided to take a guerrilla warfare into the urban areas, uh, and the, the, the conflict continued to escalate. Um, by the end of the 1970s, the, the fourth driver of the conflict comes into play and is thanks to the smuggling, the marijuana boom and the criminal networks that this created, then drug trafficking becomes a really, really important uh, source of money. Um, in particular, cocaine uh, help uh, different uh, criminal networks to link cities in Colombia with cities in the US and uh, coca crop uh, areas uh, in the Amazonian jungle. And this allowed the emergence of cartels or drug trafficking organizations that became a really powerful actor in the 1980s in Colombia and then ended up creating death squads in the early 1980s, further creating a very serious problem uh, in, in terms of uh, violence and um, the humanization of, of the enemy. And then the final uh, 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 old driver is uh, that in the middle of all of this, uh, the Colombian army had been training anti-communist doctrine uh, promoted by, different, by, by the School of the Americas and promoted by the US in the Second Cold War. And this allowed the emergence of paramilitary groups in Colombia. So all of those uh, five drivers that I have mentioned, political violence, land distribution, inequality in cities uh, and in the, in, in the countryside, drug trafficking and, and anti-communist doctrine are all present today in Colombia. Uh, despite important historical developments, uh, there have been negotiations with the M19, with the EPL, and of course, more recently with the FARC. There was also in, the in 1991 a progressive co a constitution that tried to transform and open the Colombian political space. Um, there was also a land restitution and victims law in 2011 that tried to solve some of the issues created by forced internal displacement. There have also been progressive governments in Bogota, Cali, Medellin and other cities of Colombia. And there has been the participation of military in peace negotiations. All of these have been really po po positive developments in recent years. But despite that, the old drivers continue to exist today in Colombia. Now, there are three newer drivers in which I will, I, I'm just going to list them. They are, you know, they are, I'm not going to go deep into them, but one of them, of course, is natural resources uh, in Colombia, mining, uh, oil, and different um, natural resources have been used in order to uh, promote violence by legal and illegal actors. Second, there is a really very serious, important issue of corruption. Uh, Politicians in different regions of Colombia have links uh, with uh, illegal criminal groups and state institutions have been even co-opted by some of them as the parapolitical scandals have shown and they resort to violence in order to continue protecting those criminal links. And finally, I would say failed DDR processes, demobilization, disarmament and reincorporation of, of, of previous groups has really contributed to create uh, recycling of violence in the country. And then the final driver, and then I'll start discussing a bit the outcome of the peace process and how that's going, the peace process with the FARC, I would say is precisely that. The newest driver is the feeling of betrayal um, that the Colombian state did not implement the peace agreement, did not honor its commitment to the FARC in the 2016 peace agreement and has that has contributed to many former combatants to take up arms and go back to fight a war against the state again. And that's a new driver that's creating a lot of skepticism amongst different legal armed groups. 
Let me move to the other question quickly. I would say that the 2016 peace process between the Colombian government and the FARC tried to deal precisely with all of the drivers of the conflict that I have mentioned. This was the fourth attempt of negotiations with the FARC. Um, it dealt with land distribution, it, led, it dealt with political participation, it dealt with illicit drugs, and it created a program for DDR that is a, a reincorporation of former FARC combatants with economic and security guarantees. But beyond that, this peace agreement also added reconciliation and put it at the center of peace building. It created a very sophisticated transitional justice mechanism linked to humanitarian actions and a human rights framework. Finally, this peace agreement uh, really started to be implemented in a, I would say, in a pretty uh, encouraging and positive way until 2018, uh, when uh, President Duque was elected in Colombia, and after 2018, it started to slow down. Now, the balance that we could make today is the following. First, the FARC demobilized, disarmed, and reincorporated into society, but unfortunately, more than 300 of the 10,000 members who demobilized have been killed. The stigmatization against the FARC continues, all the way from the government to other political actors, the economic and productive projects are going very slowly in the case of reincorporation of former FARC combatants, and there is a lack of land titles for collective reincorporation. Second, in terms of the Peace Tribunal, the Truth Commission, and the Unit of the Search of the Disappeared People, which are the institutions of the Transitional Justice Mechanism, we can say that they have been working ever since 2017, this year, the Truth Commission will publish the final report in June 2020, in June, uh, on the 22nd of June, which is fantastic news. This year also, the tribunal will sentence army officers and guerrilla commanders responsible for extrajudicial killings and the kidnapping of many people, two of the seven macro cases that have been opened by the tribunal. But despite all they are going to do this despite a strong opposition from the government and from the coalition parties who have been supporting the president. So it's incredible that this transitional justice mechanism has managed to do this in a really difficult political climate. Third, in terms of rural communities, they have been participating in the drafting of territorially focused development plans in 16 of the most affected regions of the country in terms of the armed conflict. However, today the communities complain the lack of participation in the implementation of these plans. Fourth, in terms of uh, uh, the illicit drugs, we could say that 90, more than 90,000 coca growers participated in a national plan of voluntary coca crop substitution. However, Today, many have left the program because of the delay in the payments uh, be, and they have gone back to replanting coca. But second, also thanks to the insecurity in the regions due to the recycling of violence in those, of, on those territories, as Juan Pablo was showing in the graphs. Fifth, in terms of security guarantees, I think this is the most concerning one of all, is a total failure of the security mechanism that was created in the peace agreement to protect former combatants, to protect communities, to protect human rights defenders and social leaders. And the reasons for that are three. First, a national commission of security guarantees that should be led by the president has met only twice in the last four years. Second, a comprehensive system for security guarantees for the participation in politics is today four years after the president's been office, not operating. And third, the unit of dismantling of criminal groups working under the general prosecutor office is actually not showing results. This really shows a total failure in such an important security mechanism that was created by the peace agreement. So to sum up, I would say that the window of opportunity for ending the armed conflict in Colombia is closing. Peace building can survive another administration which is not willing to implement the agreement and tackle the drivers of conflict 
that fuel today's direct structural and cultural violence against marginalized sectors of society. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. That was a fascinating um, uh, overview, and uh, I'd be interested to see uh, to hear your uh, your um, views on uh, uh, you know how the how the election could impact the, the peace pro process. But I guess we'll uh, we'll leave it for uh, for our Q and A. Uh, if we can now move to Kyle uh, and to the president, I guess could you again? It's a it's a very challenging question in in in, in little time, but could you actually just elaborate a little bit uh, for our audience uh, on the current landscape uh, of actors specifically of the conflict today and also which are, which are really the, 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 uh, the most recent security trends and development and especially the role and influence of transnational uh, organized crime groups in the conflict nowadays. Sure, um, sure. thank you very much uh, for the invitation and, and thank you to all who are, are watching us today. I'm going to try to move very quickly between a quick who's who of the main conflict actors today um, and then look at some various quantitative trends that we saw in the last year and how they fit together the last five or ten years in, even within the conflict, kind of complementing what Juan Pablo presented at the beginning, and then end up with some qualitative trends to understand like how the conflict is changing, what the nature of conflict is today, and adding in some of those uh, issues about transnational organized crime and kind of the uh, border issues that that Juan Pablo touched on, just going a little little deeper. And so basically, we can organize our uh, the conflict actors. The the main one is the Gulf Clan, which is one of the groups that Andre mentioned. After paramilitary mobilization did not um, go so well, shall we say, um, it was a mixed bag. Um, the Gulf Clan is created and led by former paramilitary leaders. Um, their main uh, their main leader, alias Otoniel was captured last year and he was considered one of the main drug traffickers, if not the main drug trafficker in Colombia. Nonetheless, uh, the Gulf Clan operates mainly in Northern and some parts of Western Colombia, some areas in Eastern Colombia as well, in a total of 17 departments. Um, departments for <clears throat> those who don't know, those are like provinces or states. Um, but the key is um, they don't operate in all of these departments, but it's just the easiest way to present them quickly. So that's how I will discuss all the armed actors here. Um, but many, there's a discussion here, many consider them just a drug trafficking organization, others see them as paramilitaries, kind of continuity of what existed 20 years ago. Um, but that's gonna be one of our main main actors today. The second one is the ELN, <clears throat> which is the main guerrilla group we mentioned earlier. Um, they may have been now been demoted to the second most important armed actor in Colombia. It's a very close call between the Gulf Club and the ELN. Um, they operate in 13 of Colombia's departments and have a very large presence along the border of Venezuela and inside Venezuela, which is something I'll discuss very quickly later. Um, they are the group that mainly attacks the armed forces. So the kind of traditional quote unquote conflict of a guerrilla group versus the state, This is the ELN is the main group involved in that kind of traditional conflict that still exists. Nonetheless, they only really consistently attack the armed forces along the border of Venezuela. And that's something we see throughout the country by them as a, as a kind of consistent military strategy. And the, they're very difficult to kind of deal with, understand. <clears throat> Internally, they have uh, a very horizontal system. And their main goal is armed resistance. They're not trying to overthrow the state anymore. They're kind of just trying to exist as sort of an a, a resistance actor as they see themselves in different regions in the country. And then under the third group of actors we, uh, that we talk about are FARC dissident groups whose, whose leaders used to belong to the FARC but now have created their own armed groups throughout the country. And there's kind of two macro projects, what we in CORE have called macro projects. But the first one is Second Market Italia, led by Ivan Marquez, the former FARC P negotiator in Cuba. And he wants to rebuild the FARC but is not doing so well at it. Um, they only operate in sub-regions of seven or eight departments in the country. Um, he was able to get some local criminal groups to join up, which is a very interesting phenomenon. Um, but last year, they also saw three of their commanders killed in Venezuela. So I see Venezuela rears its head again. Um, not killed by Venezuelan armed forces, but what appears to be mercenaries hired by other armed groups in Colombia. Uh, and those mercenaries are, appear to be, uh, have been paid by the other mark, macro FARC dissident project in Colombia, which is led by Gentil Duarte which operates in 15 depart departments, a very important presence inside Venezuela, but not really a safe haven anymore. Um, 
And the key, I think, with Gentil here is to we it, we have to understand how these groups operate internally, which I'll touch on a little bit more. But Gentil is a coordinator. He's not the boss, which means a lot of these groups have autonomy on a local level. And this is why one of the things we see in, in qu the quantitative trends, for example, the first one would be a continued increase of combats between illegal armed groups. Now, that is one of the main mainstays of the conflict today, or actually the, the Red Cross would say conflicts in, today in Colombia, very localized conflicts between mainly between illegal armed groups um, over territory, illegal economies, political control of territory, and in these projects that I mentioned that want to rebuild the FARC, they want to recover, in, in their words, the areas that the FARC used to control. And within the, that, that conflict, we saw homicides in areas affected by the conflict in Pedet zones, so the territorial plans that Andre mentioned, where those territorial plans have been, they are supposed to be carried out, homicides there have increased again, reaching and actually slightly surpassing 2012 levels. And 2012 being the marker of when the peace agreement, peace negotiations with the FARC began. A displacement nearly doubled last year. Um, and according to, depending on the, the, the source okay. you look at, would also have reached 2012 levels as well. And confinement increased, which is kind of goes with displacement. Colombia is known for its displacement and its conflict. Here, armed groups are confining communities to their communities, not letting them leave, not letting them receive humanitarian aid, um, instead of displacing them, kind of a new shift in the last two or three years. Um, oddly enough, with all of this, uh, combats between the armed forces and these armed groups actually decreased uh, about a little under 30% between 2021 to, uh, 2020 to 2021. Um, that is that is something that I will touch on a little bit further on, but it's important to keep in mind because it also shows, again, this kind of traditional state armed forces versus legal armed groups aspect of kind of traditional armed conflict is, is, is decreasing or in, in Colombia, not only last year, but in the last five years or so. Um, but here I want to pass very quickly to some qualitative, uh, qualitative trends. Um, one, I mentioned that there was an increase in the, the confrontations between illegal armed groups, and that's a sub-registry. I mean, we're not registering all of them. Uh, there, there are multiple sources about uh, how they continue and, and really sometimes occur kind of flying under the radar in certain areas in the country. Um, uh, so it's, it's kind of the, the increase in this trend is probably larger than what we're recording, uh, but nonetheless, qualitatively, it's, it's what I just mentioned. Um, one of the aspects of this conflict over the last four years or so uh, was the fragmentation of armed groups. I mean, we have 30 different FARC dissident groups uh, that exist in the country, but now they're a bit more organized than they were in 2020, let's say. Um, Ivan Marquez with the Seg uh, Segunda Marca Italia, say, they all say they have, a, they have a vertical hierarchy like the FARC had, but when you look at it regionally, they still there's still a lot of autonomy going on. So. Um, when I say they're slightly more organized, it's I, I really want to emphasize the slightly more organized part. It's not a pure recreation of the FARC. There's no vertical hierarchy. In, in fact, the FARC, we realize now, didn't have uh, as vertical or strong as a cohesion as, as we thought uh, during the conflict. But these groups have it even less. And those that, who are coordinated with Gentil Duarte, um, they started to make some collective decisions. They claim that they have a secretariat which was the FARC's leading body, but there's still, deal still coordinates and there's still a lot of autonomy. And so what we have is a conflict where we have the Gulf clan, which has one part of its organization is organic armed structures. Another part is subcontracting of local criminal groups. The ELN, which has a very horizontal hierarchy in, where there's a lot of autonomy on local level as well, even though they're not, they haven't broken apart, there's no divisions. There's a lot of autonomy to make their own decisions. And then FARC dissidents with also a lot of autonomy, which makes it much more difficult to kind of predict, understand, and see how these scenarios of localized armed conflict will, uh, will develop in the future. And uh, also very difficult to solve them as well. Um, last couple of ideas is there were, the government's pol policy, uh, security policy, had a lot of success last year. Uh, they were able to kill a lot of uh, leaders of illegal armed groups, they were able to attack the drug trade very well. The only problem is this is not the correct approach to dealing with the conflict today. And so we have security successes, according
according to the government's own idea of what it should be doing. But at the same time, the security situation is, is worsening. Um, so policy is, is based on an idea of a reading of the conflict, maybe 10 or 15, really more about 15 years ago, and applying that same reading to 2022, but the context has changed so drastically that no policies work. At the same time, within the armed forces, there are serious issues of corruption, whether it be police, uh, the army, uh, the Navy, and, and human rights abuses that we saw last year that we hadn't seen in, in quite a long time. Um, and then the transnational aspect. So there's two aspects here. One is the, the role of Mexican cartels is, is, is a question that comes up all the time. Um, they tend to be still be financing and supervising. That financing though allows them to have a voice in how certain illegal armed groups operate, whether that be along the border of Venezuela or on the border with Ecuador. But we don't see armed presence of Mexican cartels. There are emissaries, people who are sent in to supervise and, and bring money. And sometimes they have they have arms, but we don't see anything like we see in Mexico. And, and some some people, I think, try to over uh, give too much power to the cartels. But I want to add one last point about Venezuela, which is very, it's not the safe haven it used to be for everybody, for everybody. So Venezuela used to be a place where the ELN and the FARC, uh, along with Venezuelan armed groups, obviously, could operate almost with impunity, no problems, and 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 uh, manage a lot of what they did in Colombia. Not so much anymore. The ELN seem to still be safe in Venezuela. They have expanded drastically in the last five years. Uh, their foothold is still quite strong, uh, especially in places like Apure and Tachi. And, and, and their foothold is kind of increasing the Arco Minero, but um, they seem to be safe. And they seem to be safe because they can do things that the Venezuelan forces cannot. And they also have long standing relationships with people in the regime. But for example, the FARC dissidents, such as the one group that was renamed itself the 10th Front, it actually had a conflict with Venezuelan armed forces last year, but it won. Now that group is in conflict with the ELN and it's losing. So that, that far distant group in Apure specifically is losing a lot of ground. And so it's no longer the safe haven. In fact, this commander was killed in Colombia a few weeks ago because basically he couldn't stay in Venezuela because of how bad they were losing that conflict in Venezuela. At the same time, as I mentioned earlier, Iwan Marquez lost three commanders in Venezuela and actually has made public statements about that can be interpreted as, as a call to reestablish or improve its their group's relationship with the Venezuelan regime. And um, what this will mean, or what this means in the future is difficult to tell, especially with uh, the meeting between US, the US and Venezuela uh, a few days ago. But we also see Venezuelan forces carrying out operations against FARC dissidents, calling them uh, FARC drug trafficking terrorists, and using that as an argument to improve relationships with the United States. Um, Difficult to see again what will happen there, but I think Venezuela, the role of Venezuela vis-a-vis -vis the armed conflict in Colombia is going to change, especially with uh, how the Venezuelan regime understands the Biden presidency. Um, so I'll end there. Uh, sorry, I went a little over time, but uh, thank you very much. Not at all, Kali. It was really super interesting. And, and thanks so much for sharing the, those, those uh, really uh, insightful um, remarks. Um, Jennifer, if I can move to you now, of course, we have seen a severity climate change um, increasing interact with conflict dynamics in Colombia and everywhere in the region, complicating further uh, conflict uh, across the region. Could you talk to us a little bit on the relationship between armed conflict, deforestation and climate change in Colombia, also including the risk uh, by uh, environmental degradation? and agrarian uh, uh, challenges to security and peacekeeping, please. I know you have a presentation as well. So Tom, if you could put it up. Sure. Thanks to the International Institute for Strategic Studies, especially to Irene, Mia, and Juan Pablo Pico for having me. I'm going to focus on some research results of a project developed by FIP, Foundation Ideas for Peace and Adelphi about the environmental crisis in the Colombian Amazon to respond to this important question about the relationship between armed conflict, deforestation, and climate change in Colombia. Eventually, I will also include some analysis that did not make it into the report. Next slide, please. 
Allow me to contextualize the environmental security and human rights crisis affecting my country. Colombia, as you know, is one of the most mega diverse countries in the world, but at the same time, is the most unequal country in terms of land concentration in Latin America. As Andre mentioned before, we have a rural Gini um, of 0 0.89, and it's a, it's very unequal country, and it's the fifth unequal country in the world in this regard. We are the deadliest country against environmental defenders, as Juan Pablo mentioned. Since the signing of the peace agreement in 2016, deforestation has increased at exponential levels. We have more than 1,200 uh, 1, liters killed after the signing of the peace agreement, and the stigmatization and criminalization against rural communities and indigenous communities in frontier, in frontier and borderland regions continues. Taking together the violence against rural communities and environmental defenders, the agrarian injustice and inequality, and these increasing levels of deforestation all are indicators of this environmental crisis. Next slide, please. In this context, we want to research deforestation and this crisis in the Colombian Amazon. This region is part of the largest rainforest in the planet. The Amazon covers eight countries in South America. The Amazon rainforest is of special importance to the world, not only because of its great biodiversity, but also because it, because it is an important carbon sink. It produces more than 20% of the oxygen of the world, and it regulates climate and water worldwide. So the deforestation that occurs in this region does not affect only Latin America, but the entire world. As I was saying, since since 2016, deforestation in Colombia has skyrocketed, and the most affected region within the country was the Colombian Amazon, which comprises 10 departments in the south of the country. According to the IBM data, deforestation in the Colombia Amazon region increased from 56,962 hectares in 2015 to 507,615 hectares in 2018. On the right of the screen, you find the map of Colombia. The area highlighted in red is the Northwestern Amazonian Arc, which is one of the most affected areas of deforestation. Next slide, please. This crisis is explained by the combination of several factors. Partly because there is a reconfiguration of the armed conflict that Kyle uh, has explained better than me. <laughs> Before its demobilization and for decades, the FARC exercised regulation process over some parts of the population in specific territories of the Amazon, which had a paradoxical environmental conservation effect, according with Rio and Rojas. This effect was intentional and unintentional. On the one hand, the guerrillas impose regulations on the communities. The communities should go, should go to reforest the banks of the rivers. They had limits on the amount of hectares they could slash and burn. The communities should cultivate not only coca, but also another crops. But on the other hand, the war prevented the entry of large extractive economies activities into these territories. After the agreement and the subsequent demobilization of, of, the, of the FAR guerrilla, there was a vacuum of armed power that was taken over by other armed groups that do not have the same kind of relationship with civil society nor with their territories. So there was a significant change in the dynamics of violence. Armed groups are fragmented, other armed groups appear, they're from contingent alliances, they compete for access and control of population, territories, and resources in these important borderland areas. And they perceive the environmental defender, such as enemies, for their interest. So violence increase against them. Next slide, please. In this context of reconfiguration of the armed conflict, there are several economic drivers of deforestation in the Colombian Amazon. Some of them, are associated with war economies, 
but are not only carried out by armed groups. Rather, we see important economic and political elites involved in these drivers of deforestation. On top of that, there is a significant involvement of public authorities and corruption. The main drivers of deforestation in the Amazon are, first one, let, uh, the first, the main driver of deforestation is land grabbing for cattle ranching. This is linked to others, such as the construction of roads and paths that cross areas of special ecological importance. We also see illegal mining, especially the exploitation of gold in rivers and protected areas and the crops, of course, for illicit uses. I have, not, um, I have no time to explain where are the main territories in which we can find these um, illegal economies, but I invite you to, to read the report <laughs> and you can see more details about the specific economic driver and the territories in which we can find it. Next slide, please. There are also other factors that generate environmental conflicts, which in turn lead to violence against the communities and environmental defenders. For example, the extractive mining economies. The mining zones defined by the government affect the forest reserve zones that are protected areas. Also affect the indigenous resguardos and their aquatic and wetland ecosystems. In Putumayo, it also affects the moorland complex. On top of that, the mining authority has delivered mining titles for the extraction of minerals inside of protected areas. The unfortunately, unfortunately, this the, the illustrated case here is the Jago Heapapuris National Park. Next slide, please. These drivers of deforestation and factors generating the crisis have been added to the regressive state policies that have the deepened agrarian and climate injustice. Andre mentioned some of them, I'm just going to list. First, the national government has failed to comply with the peace agreements. There is no progress at all on the agrarian issue of comprehensive rural reform. The government has not adequately addressed the illicit drugs issue. On the contrary, the national government has failed to comply with the agreements with the coca growers and has promoted militaristic responses to curb deforestation that don't solve the root problems, but are palliative solutions accompanied by serious human rights violation and stigmatization. Next slide, please. So in security, the drivers of deforestation and regressive responses generate several effects on the security of communities and on their territories. Land grabbing for cattle ranching leads to the loss of forest and these ecosystem lose their capacity to be carbon sinks. Mining pollutes the waters and in turn, the mercury used in its exploitation poisons the fish and food consumed by local communities. The roads built in protected areas break the connectivity of several of the ecosystem in the region. The Amazon, lose its balance and its capacity to regulate water and climate. The environmental degradation in turn has a direct impact on the communities that are affected by changes in land use, their food sovereignty and the rights over water and over their territories is threatened, as well as their capacity to reproduce themselves and their social identity. This makes them more vulnerable to the actions of armed groups. It is a vicious cycle that repeats itself. Next slide, please. To respond to this crisis, it is necessary to understand it as part of a global process in which the violence of the armed conflict is not separated or isolated from the violence of the market or from the structural violence. Additionally, we require, we require progressive responses oriented towards agrarian and climate justice. What does it mean? That means an agenda committed to carrying out a sense of equity for historically oppressed social classes and groups in agrarian societies, as June Borras and Jennifer Franco mentioned. Mm, thanks, I will be glad to, to answer some of some questions. Thank you, Irene. Thanks, Jennifer. That was actually a, a great presentation. I was uh, looking at your vicious circle slide. I think it's, it's very, it says it all, and it is a topic which is very, 
um, interesting for us uh, as we really focus a lot on climate security. So I'm sure we'll have uh, more conversation on that. But uh, in the interest of time, then I, I, I now uh, move to Annie. And of course, we have seen the conflict as also uh, international and geopolitical drivers as well as ramification. I guess Annie would be really great for you to, in a way, talk, tell us a little bit uh, of some of the international drivers and notably the, the, the crisis in Venezuela. So what's your outlook on that? And obviously we had an election a couple of days ago, so we we'll, we'll love to hear your uh, your view on what this will what this could mean for the conflict and, and in general, what is your assessment so far and forecast? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the questions and for the invitation. Um, I want to start to briefly talk about the congressional elections and also uh, further uh, talk about the coming, coming up presidential elections in May and probably uh, the runoff in June. And also I want to talk about uh, uh, 16 seats that have been assigned in these congressional elections that are very important for the topic of this presentation, which are the Curules de la Paz. Uh, which were assigned to victims. So let me let me just start uh, really quick by saying that uh, you know uh, this past Sunday Colombia held congressional elections and inter-party consultations, which uh, really in Colombia uh, work as uh, primaries, and um, the left-wing coalition uh, attracted 47 percent of voters in the primaries, and uh, we foresee that uh, Congress will be uh, fragmented. Uh, at first, we thought it would be very highly fragmented, but right now we're, we're seeing a different trend after this, uh, the vote on Sunday. Um, however, you know, uh, the centrist uh, coalition of hope had very poor showing in the primaries, along, allowing the central right to emerge as the primary option against the left-wing uh, presidential candidate, Gustavo Petro. Um, also, in, in, in uh, sort of surprisingly, the results of these congressional elections show that traditional parties uh, remain strong. They still have a strong footing uh, in, in the Senate and in Congress. And uh, that will mean that the next president, whoever that might be, will have to negotiate with them in order to pass um, legislation and pursue its, its agenda. And um, we also foresee a uh, comfort risk that uh, Petro is the most likely candidate to win the next uh, election in the June runoff. And uh, the alternative scenario that we're considering is uh, uh, Federico Gutierrez, the center right candidate, um, probably winning also the election in case um, that the electorate uh, uh, moves toward an anti-Petro or anti-leftist um, sentiment. And what does this mean? Uh, we, we've seen that in the last presidential elections, uh, 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 Gustavo Petro uh, came second and uh, his support uh, among voters in all regions, in all um, uh, demographics uh, has uh, increased. And uh, uh, very notably in Antioquia, um, which uh, you know, was a very stronghold of the right and uh, this, this really means that there is a significant change in, in economic policy coming up in uh, Colombia's modern history. Um, so what we're seeing again is a polarization uh, between the right and the left uh, coming up uh, on, the, on the presidential elections. And you know, this hope that was uh, uh, put in the center, an um, interesting called coalition of hope, after these, um, these results, uh, we see that uh, um, it's coming uh, really weak, really weak for the infighting that they have coming up to, the, to, the, to these inter-party cons uh, consultations. They came uh, with different candidates, not unified. And uh, this has uh, resonated with voters uh, who, who are um, you know, looking for, uh, who, who are looking for, for a different prospect of, uh, of candidates. Uh, on one hand, uh, Gustavo Petro really does offer um, a different outlook. He is the anti-establishment candidate, although he has been in politics for a long time. But the discourse and the intention that he is portraying himself as in uh, in the debate, in the debates, as well as uh, in all his interventions in his public interventions, he is a candidate of uh, the anti-establishment 
uh, of the new trend of breaking with the past. And um, uh, notably, he's also trying to break with his own past as a former guerrilla member. And um, so he's, he's pursuing, uh, uh, presenting himself as a candidate that will negotiate, that will uh, give room for all voices to be heard, um, including those of the ELN. And um, as uh, Kyle uh, very uh, rightfully um, portrayed, you know, the, the armed groups presently in Colombia, uh, we foresee that if, Candy, if uh, Petro becomes the president, he will have to um, negotiate somehow with the, with the ELN who will want to have some kind of um, negotiation different from what the FARC did before. So um, they know what the problems uh, have been, as uh, uh, also uh, rightly uh, described in this panel, and they, they will not be willing to give up arms as uh, the FARC did in, in not receiving all the promises that, uh, um, that uh, you know, the government did previously. So um, this increase in violence that also Juan Pablo has uh, rightly pointed out is probably going to continue regardless of who the next president is. And it's because also that we cannot forget that, you know, in 2019, as well as last year, civil society in Colombia has taken the streets. The civil society is no longer afraid of protesting and being tagged or being named or being described as, you know, a left this guerrilla, but they have found a new force. And, uh, you know, whether it's Petro or, uh, or any other uh, uh, next president, they will have to deal with a lot of, um, um, I mean, I said unrest, but the problems that we are seeing, and this connects to the previous question that you had, the, geo the uh, geopolitical question. You know, we, we, we are in the post-pandemic world, we have a, a, a crisis in Ukraine and Russia. And what we're, where we're seeing right now, and we have seen cyber attacks even in Colombia, as in Vima, uh, you know, uh, is one of the, um, the institutions, the state institutions that, uh, that, that were attacked. So we are no longer just talking about Colombia in itself, but we need to look at the brighter and the bigger picture and see how other forces play out. Um, um, Petro being a leftist uh, a candidate and probably the next president will have to have a different stance that is not uh, really aligned with the, with the world left, but has to be very um, uh, flexible in terms of having to deal with the internal and the, and the current uh, economic problems that we're seeing after the pandemic or during the pandemic, because it's not over yet. But, uh, but he's encountering a, you know, strong institutions. He will encounter strong institutions in Colombia that are changing, but we, uh, we have the constitutional court, we have a Congress that he will not dominate. Uh, in fact, um, the political right, if you add up all the, all the parties and the candidates that, um, that in the Senate and the Congress, uh, they still will dominate uh, the, uh, you know, the vote in, in Congress in, uh, the next president will have to um, uh, uh, negotiate, negotiate with them, as well as having an international international position that uh, does not strictly align him to the Western countries or to the Eastern countries, given also the amount of um, Chinese uh, in investment that is arriving to the country, especially in extractives. And uh, you know, his stance on uh, not giving or not renewing permits to extractive industries here with the, the high prices um, of commodities and, and oil, and, and it's, it's probably gonna have to change at least in the short term. I know that we are uh, really close to the end, so I wanna give um, space for questions. And, uh, and also I'm, I'm willing to take any questions that uh, you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Sunny. It's, it's really, uh, what you depict is quite a complex scenario even for, uh, you know, whoever is going to win is, 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 is not going to be an easy one. I guess we have lots of questions here and we have lots of questions myself and, uh, and Juan, but of course we will give priority to that, to our audience. Uh, if you allow me, I will take maybe another five minutes, uh, five, 10 minutes because we're at the end of the webinar now, but, 
I guess there are a number of questions around uh, the uh, police reform and uh, the security um, condition uh, in the agreed agreed in the in the peace uh, accord, which also Andre had mentioned. Uh, anyone wants to take this question, or what is the? Yeah, Andre, I guess it's probably for you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Irene. I guess I'll make uh, two comments in regards to the questions. Um, and if you allow me a, a, a very final comment in terms of what the, the elections do, I think the prospects for the future. I think in terms of the reform of the police and um, and whether the police is going to move away from the Ministry of Defense to the Ministry of Interior, I think that's a really important question that hasn't been put on the table yet. Is after the demonstrations in Colombia last year where there was lots of violence by the police, they has started a, a program of re restructuring the police, but is all of that within the scope of the government doing these reforms, which shows that perhaps one of the biggest failures of the peace agreement, one, one, one of the biggest difficulties of this peace agreement is that it didn't take into account security sector reform. It was, it was of course, very difficult to put it into the negotiation table. Santos knew that that could probably break the, 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 the cohesion within the negotiation of the government. So for that reason, he left it out. But it's been a tremendous challenge not to have a security sector reform. Uh, Colombia needs a security sector reform and has needed that for a long time and it hasn't been done. Um, then the second thing in terms of the security mechanism, I think that definitely if you have a new president coming into office with the political will to implement the security mechanism, he has all the, uh, all the tools to do that. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the main problems is that the most important institution perhaps of that security mechanism was the National Commission of Security Guarantees because that National Commission was like the umbrella organization trying to synchronize all the different elements that needed to be implemented within the peace agreement to deliver security in the territories and national security and protect different sectors of Colombian society. So, of course, it boils down to political willingness. And then the final thing in terms of, 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 of the elections, I think, uh, you know, if, if you hear the discourse that uh, Federico Gutierrez has and the discourse that Petro, the two leading candidates, have at the moment, you can see that the this political debate is going to be going around two fundamental issues. The issue of life, how to, 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 to transform Colombia in a powerful nation that protects life. That's Gustavo Petro. And I think that's a really broad agenda that could include many different sectors of society. But the discourse of Federico Gutierrez is around security. It's around how can we you know, bring back security to the country. And I think that's another discourse that can bring a broad sector of Colombian society around. And I think that's going to be the big debate around in the elections. Thanks, Andre. And I guess we also have a number of questions on what, what next, right, in the agreement. We have now what sort of agreement is possible with the ELN, for instance. Uh, more in general, and I guess, uh, again, it's a question we have, we have been this debating and we heard Andre and Ami, but maybe the rest of the panel, do, do you see, I mean, um, what's, your, what's your view on, uh, on the outlook for the peace agreement or for more peace agreements? Kyle or Jennifer, yeah. Yeah, I think I can tackle this extremely difficult question. Um, for peace agreements with the ELN, for example, um, the, the, it, it's it's not easy. Um, actually, a, a Petro government is not guaranteed a peace agreement with the ELN. The ELN and plus most armed groups in the world, you negotiate with your enemies, not not with someone. Petro is not considered an enemy. The risk for the ELN in a Petro presidency is that Petro somehow sends a message that they are obsolete, and that will not uh, help whatsoever. Also, Petros has taken some steps back from a very radical approach of saying he would sign a disarmament agreement with ELN in three months. He's taken some steps back from that because that is just not going to work, not going to happen. And with FICO, it's very difficult because it's not clear if there's any actual political will. And so because of what's happened in the last four years with ELN and the Duque government, especially the not 
recognizing the protocols for breaking the agreement and, and uh, then some public, <laughs> very, very public uh, confessions of confidential work that was going on by the outgoing High Commissioner for Peace at the time. There is no trust. The first step, whoever's president has to build trust with the ELN. And secondly, um, once trust is built, I think there, there can be discussions around the agenda, which is very vague, it kind of points out some steps that can be taken during the negotiation process to later get the agreement with civil society. But it's also not clear how large of a negotiation the Colombian government is willing to accept, whether it be Petro, Fico, I'm not really gonna say Fajardo, but um, how large of a negotiation the world to accept. The ELN very much want a negotiation where they feel treated at least equally to the FARC, and that's simply just not, gonna, not going to take place. Um, and there are eternal issues with the ELN. The ELN does not have a clear agreement uh, in favor of peace internally, which I think, to be honest, is fine. The FARC also came to the negotiation table in 2012, and not everyone was agree agreed in, in negotiating. In fact, Ivan Marquez, the head negotiator, was against negotiating when he got to the table in 2012. So I think it's a little bit, we shouldn't expect the ELN to be 100% on board to negotiating at the beginning of, of talks, but the talks should instead actually look to kind of build that confidence, build the trust and convince the ELN because each process, um, as the FARC negotiators would say, even though you cannot make a lot of comparisons between FARC and the ELN, yeah, the process transforms both negotiating teams and how they understand, understand things. But there are a lot of internal issues with the ELN that make them very difficult. And there's another final issue is that they don't believe in taking over power anymore. They know they're not going to win the war, but they don't care. That's not their goal. Their goal is to exist and resist on a local level. So when that's the case, the incentives to negotiate are also very difficult. And, and so they read, for example, the protests from last year the poor government in Duque, in the Duque administration, what they call a poor government, they they read that politically as a justification for, for their war. There's also part of a wing that's very political, but very radical that does not want, that doesn't, that's looking at the situation in Colombia saying, why would we negotiate now? And obviously there are then the more, uh, some radical, those radical political wings are also very economically strong, very influential then in, inside the ELN and have a large presence in Venezuela. So their incentives to negotiate are also difficult to, to identify. So, I mean, the ELN negotiation is very difficult. There are attempts to try to move it forward, but I think we would have to be very realistic in what the, what the first steps need to be, um, what the challenges are on both the ELN side and the government side, and then think different scenarios, uh, thinking of a Petro presidency versus a, a right-wing presidency, whoever it may be. But I think there's an idea, and I'll close with this, that a Petro presidency being leftist would negotiate easily with the ELN. No, the ELN don't actually would not, they would, they prefer to negotiate with the right wing than with the left. So that's going to be an interesting challenge if Petro actually, if he actually. Thanks, Kyle. That's uh, that, that was actually really, really interesting. And uh, there is another very intriguing question of the link between uh, um, Park and uh, Wagner Group, but I guess I just wanted to, maybe if we have time at the end, uh, but I just wanted to ask Jennifer, maybe what is your view on the outlook in terms of agrarian reforms and uh, in general, uh, uh, better protection and, and uh, involvement of the, of, the, of the environment in the, in the, in the vicious circle so that it become a virtuous one? Sure. <laughs> the environment will be and should be must be a very specific issue in the future, in the governance, uh, not just for the Amazon region that I was presented before, but for the entire country. Climate change is it's real. And the negative effects and impacts of climate change in rural and urban communities across Colombia are real. So the next government, Petro, Federico Gutierrez, or <laughs> the person who, who arrives to the presidency just, just to, to deal with this climate change issue and just include it into the agenda. So um, the, the main challenge to me, in my opinion, is the future governance 
over the territories, over the resources, over the citizenship. If we bring the political economy approach to understand this problem, we're going to ask about the, the power relationship, who has the right over what resources, who therefore is excluded for those resources. So who owns what, who has the citizenship, who is recognized by the government, those are the kinds of questions that are important right now, because we're not talking about just the resources or the Amazon or the biodiversity in Colombia and all these amazing resources that Colombia has. We're talking about how we're going to face the climate change, how we're going to face all these challenges, uh, because the vulnerable communities, the exclusion, the marginalization of over those communities. These communities are going to, to deal with these kind of problems. Those communities are going to deal with the inequality, the poverty, and the negative impacts of climate change. So we, we are facing the, the rule and the governance over these territories and the recognition of the citizenship and, and rights. So that's my, my answer. Thanks, Jennifer, and thanks to all our speakers. I think we have now a very clear uh, view of what the conflict is about and where it's going. I guess uh, uh, there are lots of uncertainty, lots of challenges for the new administration, new president. I hope we will uh, be able to um, convene you again, maybe after the election for, a, for, a, for, a, for an update of this conflict uh, webinar. But thanks so much. Um, this is, as I said, uh, one of our conflict briefings. So we are looking forward to um, engage in many more uh, conflict briefings. And um, thanks so much again to Andre, to Jennifer, to Annie, and to Kyle. We, we, we wish we could actually continue for another two hours, but unfortunately we have to close here. Thanks Juan, I know you are sick, so it's very good that you were with us today. And um, see you in the next conflict briefing. Thanks so much, bye-bye.